thanks very much for the introduction. I'm so pleased to bring this program to the Cleveland Jewish community, really as a partnership between Case Western Reserve University's Lifelong Learning Program and Federation and the AEN, the Academic Engagement Network. Um, as many of you who are familiar with CASE's Lifelong Learning Program, you know that we work to bridge between the ivory tower and the public square through our courses, our lectures, our panel discussions like this one. What we're really trying to do is to bring academics, scholars, into conversation with the general public. And this particular event here tonight, this panel on American Jews and Israel, where is this relationship headed? Judging from the crowd, it's clear that this panel of scholars has something very important to offer the community. And their insights, I know, will not disappoint. Um, I want to say a word about AEN, the Academic Engagement Network, uh, before I turn over the panel to the group here. And I know Professor Ken Walter will speak a little bit more about it. Um, but this organization, Academic Engagement Network, stands for academic freedom and for freedom of expression. It supports robust conversation about Israel in public forums and on campus and is so vital for campus culture and campus life today. Um, Ken Walzer, who I'm going to turn the mic over to in just a moment, received his PhD from Harvard University. He worked for 43 years at, as a professor at James Madison College of Michigan State University. Michigan State University. And among other things, he served as associate dean there, as well as director of Jewish studies at Michigan State University. And uh, now he serves as the executive director of AEN, Academic Engagement Network. And with that, Ken, I'll turn the platform over to you. Hello, Cleveland. Hello. Uh, I do have the privilege of serving as executive director of the Academic Engagement Network. We're a new faculty organization. We're a national organization. We're only two and a half years old. And we've got 600 faculty members on more than 200 campuses. Mm -hmm. And we together, collectively, try to counter the BDS movement, the Boycott, Investment, and Sanctions movement. We try to uh, serve as a lobby for academic freedom um, and to stand against disruptions of free speech on campus. And uh, we also fight anti-Semitism wherever it appears. Um, we happen to be in Cleveland uh, this week because we're running a short course for some of our members who are in the audience. We're staying at Glidden House, which is a beautiful place to, to do this. And we feel very comfortable here in Cleveland. And I hope we're going to stimulate you in thinking about important stuff. Our topic tonight is American Jews in Israel. Where is the re relationship headed? And to talk about this, um, we have three really good scholars. Uh, who are able to give their own distinctive uh, takes on this question. Um, to my immediate left, your right, uh, is Rachel Fish, who is the Associate Director of the Schusterman Israel Studies Center at Brandeis University. Um, next to her is Steve Bain, who's the Director of Contemporary Jewish Life for the American Jewish Committee and the, the head of the Koppelman Institute uh, for American-Jewish-Israeli Relations. And finally, uh, on the far side, is Steve Cohn, who's research professor of Jewish social policy at Hebrew Union College <coughs> Jewish Institute of Religion. I'm going to frame our discussion and turn it over to the experts. There has been a historic change in the relationship between American Jewry and Israel. I think we all feel it. <coughs> what once was a source of unity in our community is becoming a source of disunity, um, of challenge, of uh, wrestling with difficult questions. What are the reasons for this change? Uh, what makes Israel such a difficult topic these days um, what are the fault lines of division in our community over Israel? And what's the timeline in terms of how this has come about? Rachel Fish. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, 
Cleveland Jewish Community and Academic Engagement Network. This one might be a major fault line, but I think the Celtics Cavs game also might be a major fault line. And as someone who's a Boston Celtics fan, I just want to put that out there right now. You can dislike me for many reasons. Um, but in all seriousness, go Celtics. <laughs> um, really, I, I do think there's a lot to say about this conversation in terms of the Israel diaspora relationship, the American Jewish connection, specifically um, in terms of the trajectory from the establishment of the state to the present. And knowing that we only have seven minutes, none of us are going to be able to cover all of that. The historian in me says I would like to talk about the David Ben Gurion. Um, Jacob Blaustein Agreement, which really began to set up what the arrangement ought to look like for the North American Jewish communal relationship with the leadership of the State of Israel. This is an important framework, but it has transformed over time, and many within the younger generation specifically do not have any historical reference of the blaustein Gorey Agreement. They also do not have any reference of Jewish historical experiences of 1948, 1967, 1973, the Oslo Accords, the first Intifada, some don't even remember September 11th. So this timeline for them in terms of Israel is that Israel has always existed, Israel has always been in conflict, and according to perceptions, at least, in how this um, entity is discussed, especially in the media, Israel may often be perceived as the Goliath and not the David. So all of that um, has changed in many ways the relationship and understanding for, I would argue, the younger generation. Another piece of this is that Israel as a Jewish and democratic state with a healthy tension between particularism and universalism does not always seem to make sense to many in the younger generation because that seems anachronistic. Meaning, they imagine that every nation state ought to be America. They think America is the norm rather than the exception. And they do not understand that many other nation states that exist in the world um, are configured or framed along more particularistic lines. With the cohort that tends to be more liberal, progressive, and uh, very much values universalist ideals, that Jewishness component being prioritized, what seems to be at the expense of the other, and the other in this case is the Palestinians, the fact that Israel has had control over the territory of the West Bank specifically raises serious concerns. It does not mean, and I want to be very clear, that the generation is anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, but it does change one's understanding, connection to, and relationship with this particular place. All of this combined makes the conversation, for many, a conversation that from, tends to focus more on the emotional component and much less on the component about what they actually know and understand about the place. Meaning, many of them are not literate about the state of Israel and do not know how or have a historical scaffolding in which they can engage in this conversation. And so part of the conversation for us as educators is to ask, what does it mean to be literate about Israel in the 21st century? And then how do we frame that conversation and transmit that knowledge with our students through their experiences as well, Jewish day school, Jewish education, birthright, which is a tipping point in some respects because now you have a generation in which the majority have had, at least in Israel experience, but it doesn't always mean that they still come back with a certain set of knowledge or content. I do want to share just a few ideas around this uh, Israel-Diaspora relationship. There is one view, which is the distancing hypothesis that you may hear of or know about. This is the idea that younger Jews are distancing across the political spectrum towards Israel, uh, in terms of their relationship with Israel. And 
and Zionism does not play this innate um, idea in their life. Another perspective is a stasis perspective, I would argue. This is, in some ways, advocated by someone like Professor Lynn Sachs at the Cohen Center from Brandeis University, who says, you know, nothing much has actually changed in the longer trajectory of the Israel-Jewish, um, American-Jewish relationship, and that younger Jews have always been more critical of Israel, but when they go through these life cycle events, that ultimate changes and you become older and hopefully wiser, and so you don't necessarily hold on to these very critical views. Then there's also Ted Sasson, formerly from Middlebury and also from, um, I got it, also from Brandeis, who says birthright really is a tipping point, and more Jews are now going to Israel, they are seeing Israel, and so the question becomes, how do American Jews see themselves in the Israel experience? And this, uh, these are three different views. I think we can come back to these three perspectives and talk about them, both from a historical analysis, a social scientist analysis, as well as our own anecdotal experiences. But I want to add one more piece in my minute. And that piece is, how are younger Israelis viewing the American Jewish community? And in that respect, I would say that the conversation has greatly moved away from the conversation about interests, meaning it's not about Israelis needing America and the American Jewish community in the same way, but rather uh, Israelis are interested in a conversation about purpose, and it's a paradigm of purpose, and Shmuel Rosner has written quite a bit about this. This is a younger generation that doesn't want to only see Israel in terms of a Jewish safe haven, but rather what does it mean for Israel to be Jewish in the 21st century, what is the purpose of that, and is that conversation being had in Hebrew, and not only in the American dialectical conversation? Thank you, Rachel. Dr. Stephen Bain. Well, that, thank you, Ken. Uh, I also would like to uh, express my, uh, my honor and privilege to join you this evening. I've had the um, uh, good luck to be able to observe the academic engagement network for several years. And uh, to watch it flourish as an organization has enormous implications for the Jewish community that I think we really need to uh, put on the table. Uh, American Jews have had a love affair with campus for at least uh, since World War II. Understandably so. It's our road to social mobility. It also captures the values of America that we so identify with. And we know the old adage, uh, we have a love affair and the, your other partner doesn't satisfy you completely, you tend to react with a great deal of anger and disappointment. As a result, when things have gone wrong on campus, the Jewish community often reacts with a great deal of anger, sometimes even hysteria. The Academic Engagement Network, under Ken's leadership, Mark Budoff, the former chancellor of the University of California, and uh, the others they've attracted uh, uh, to work with them, it really has said the way to engage the campus is not by throwing blocks. The way to engage the campus is by academic engagement. That means teaching, research, scholarship. Those are all the vehicles that I think the community needs to be able to appreciate. Rather than have discussions that I hear around my Shabbat table frequently of, uh, I won't send my, my child to an anti-Semitic campus, it's not as simple as all that. And the, the, the terms are, are not nearly as black and white as many of us would uh, have led to believe. So I really want to salute the work that's been done here, and uh, really I'm very honored to be part of it. That was not part of my seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my seven minutes, I really want to do two things. Um, I want to pick up on some of Rachel's comments as to uh, why this is taking place, and then perhaps be a bit suggestive of what, what should be done in terms of trying to bridge the two communities. Uh, my pet theory on Israel Daskal relations uh, is that it's very much like a pyramid. Meaning, at the top, Jewish leadership in America, Jewish leadership in Israel, relations are very, very close. The further down you go down the pyramid, the greater the distance. Now, what does that mean for us? And this is my quarrel, I think, with Len Sachs and Brandeis. The reality of American Jewish life over the last 30, 40 years has been growing the simulation. That's the harsh reality. Would our children be Jewish, let alone would our grandchildren be Jewish? <coughs> the more distant one is from Jewish concerns, the more distant one 
not going to be from Israel. You know, Israel is not just a nation state that we happen to know is up there in the Middle East and uh, is, uh, say, a little, a little America or a little, a little Great Britain. What's important to it about it is the nation state of Jewish people. If we don't care about peoplehood, we're going to be less involved with Israel. Whatever the data in the day, which I think are frankly are masked by the fact that we have a rise in orthodoxy, which is some extent compensates for those who have drifted away, you cannot underestimate um, the degree of assimilation, of the level of assimilation is taking place. And there's so many different parameters of it. As long as assimilation is a driver in American Jewish life, and it's been this way for again about 30, 40 years, you're going to see more distancing from Israel. Or to go back to my pyramid model, at the top of the pyramid, relations were made as close as, close as they ever did. The further down you go down the pyramid, into the Jewish street, into the suburbs, if you will, into Cleveland, Ohio, the greater the distance we are going to be from Israel. Second, um, the, uh, the second factor, I think, that's uh, involved in all this is that um, uh, what uh, my, my late mentor, the great Charles Liebman, the leading sociologist of Jewish religion, used to argue that um, Israeli is like talking about assimilation in America because it makes them feel good. American Jews like talking about the absence of religious pluralism in Israel because it makes us feel good. In other words, we have something that they don't have. They have something that we don't have. So therefore, we enjoy talking about that which makes us feel good. The reality is, again, this I think is the uh, key point here, is that um, American Jews inclined towards what I would call liberal consensus, meaning the consensus of values of democracy, freedom of speech, universalism, uh, abortion rights, if you will. Those are all, all areas that American Jews pride themselves on. Me and the rafters behind the civil rights class. Israeli society has been much more particularistic, much more survivalist, much more conservative. In those circumstances, you have two communities drifting apart because one prides itself on its liberalism, the other prides itself much more on its particularism. For totally different reasons. American Jews are quite secure in America. I mean, at times we tell the narrative of anti-Semitism. The real narrative of America is that no society in task for Jewish history has been as receptive of Jewish participation as has the United States. That means we're comfortable in advocating for liberal social causes, and we think that's great, and it is great. But at the same time, our Israeli friends look at that and they say, how can you talk about Israeli national security and say you're an advocate of Israeli national security when you voted for Hillary Clinton by 80% because you agree with her abortion rights? We can't stand Obama because he was the president who caused so much tension between Israel and the United States. It's this conflict of values of a liberal consensus by an American Jewry paralleled by a drift rightward among Israeli society that makes for a greater gap between the two communities. The exception, of course, is the Orthodox, and I'll come back to this, that they look at Israel, they like what they see, and therefore they are more intensely involved and more intensely attached to Israel than any other sector of the Jewish community. Thirdly, and that relates to the, uh, the larger question of I by this drift, um, is that uh, Perhaps the best illustration of it, frankly, is American presidential politics. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of the United States really have a marvelous relationship. American Jews, with the exception of the Orthodox, find this to be one of the most problematical, if not the most problematical, president that we've ever had. Younger Jews look at this and they say, for us, the President of the United States is a, uh, a phenomenon that we don't identify with at all. The Israelis look and they say, when was the last president who moved the embassy to Jerusalem? They all promised they would do it. But here's the one who actually came through. What do we do about this? What, uh, what should be done? Let me just offer some, uh, in the spirit of uh, Tom Swift, some, uh, some modest recommendations. Number one, I think we do need to set to rest. Again, the Vibrator's comments further, but uh, I think we need to set to rest. The, the view of many sociologists would like to say, just a matter of age. As they get older, they'll be more intensely involved with Israel, or at least as intensely involved as their forebears. That negates the trend of assimilation. It suggests that assimilation is not a factor. That's to close your eyes to what's happening. 
is we have to set to rest what I call the complacency theory of American Jewish trade relations. What we should be doing in its place, I think, is several other things. Number one, and Ken mentioned this in his opening comments, we need to ask what are Israeli perceptions of American Jews in general, in particular, and the diaspora in general. Next week, at the age, next month, at the AJC Global Forum, which we first time actually held in Jerusalem, we set up a panel on Israel diaspora relations, but it's really a panel of Israelis only, speaking about Israeli perceptions of the American Jewish community. That's where the education needs to take place. Within our own community, I think we need to do something else that in many ways will shake up a lot of what, what I call communal wisdom. We need less in the way of Israeli advocacy, more in the way of Israeli education. Uh, for many years, I was involved with AJC's project into Shams. Chancellor Herman of the University of Illinois was with us a number of years ago. We bring influential Americans, Jews and non-Jews, to Israel for a first-hand look. The purpose of it is not Hasbara. The purpose of it is not propaganda. It is education. We need to do much more of that. Lastly, and this goes back to uh, Rachel's earlier comments, the major gap in terms of uh, Israeli society in recent years has been the collapse of liberal Zionism. Um, it would be a disaster for American Jewry, a disaster for Israel, if the cause of Israel became identified as a conservative cause. The key to the U.S.-Israel relationship is that historically it's been bipartisan. We need to restore that bipartisanship by raising the banner of liberal Zionism, even as it parallels, as it coexists, with what has emerged as a dominant form of conservative Zionism. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Steve Cohen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it works, right? Yeah. I'm good. Thank you, Ken, for inviting me. It's really nice to meet Rachel for probably the first time. I'm not sure. And uh, it's always a great pleasure to be Steve Bain. 1975, we're in the same class? Oh, I remember. It's much, it's much worse. Steve Cohen and I were dating the same girl. <laughs> 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 Neither of her, us married her, so it's really good to get it. Another show at the same time, but somebody can't. Don't listen to her. Um, and, um, he's, trying to, so I need to do a little bit of introduction. I, um, Robert Merton speaks about uh, recognition by obliteration. It's where you, your ideas go out there and no one recognizes them. So you named all the other scholars who are behind the major theories. Uh, I was the distancing about this. I know you were, but I thought you would talk about it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't talk about it until at least you'd be all right, fine, listen to that. Um, I, I didn't mention that. Um, so my, my uh, I, I, I identify very much with what Steve said, and, and we share very much in common, not only dating partners, <laughs> that, but we, uh, a lot of our thinking, a lot of our thinking actually um, has been usually informed and has been informed actually uh, by reading it, or sometimes writing it, very similar uh, uh, articles. I, I really think that, uh, except for the Orthodox in America, I mean, it's a, it's a very, that's a very big exception, uh, American Jewry is growing more distant from Israel, and there are many reasons for that. Now, and I, we don't have time to go into all of them, but I'll just, I'll just mention a few of them. One is, to understand American Jewry, you have to remember that there are two types of people in the world. Those who divide the world into two, and those who don't. So I would like to divide the world into three. Um, the Orthodox, which itself is a complex group of people with a lot of variations. Jews in name only, otherwise known as genos. And, um, and the people between the Jews in name only and the Orthodox who are um, uh, engaged American Jews who are not Orthodox, which includes a lot of people in this room, all, you're all, that, minus the, the, the few Orthodox people in the room as well. Um, and what's going on in American Jewry is that the two wings are growing quickly and enormously. And the, and the, um, and the, the engaged non-Orthodox are, are declining rapidly in size. Uh, on one foot, what's an example? If people in our generation, 20, uh, 55 to 69 years old, uh, there are 470,000 non-Orthodox <coughs> people who are married to Jews. Of people 25 to 39 years old, there are 100,000 such people. There's a, there's a huge decline in the group that is most engaged in Jewish life. One, they're married, and two, they're married to, to uh, the Jews. So this is among the non-Orthodox. So what we're seeing now is 
the contraction of conservative reform Judaism, decline of uh, decline of uh, donors to, to Jewish federations, the aging of donors to Jewish federations, uh, the aging of the uh, uh, and, and a variety of ways of the decline in Shefta schools, decline of, uh, of, um, of people in uh, in congregational schools outside of Orthodoxy, and that's what's going on. So that all well, just that affects the relationship of American Jews as basically the non-Orthodox move from engaged to not engaged. Why are they so many non engaged? The children are being to marry. Today, among non-Orthodox Jews, 1869, 60% have a non-Jewish parent. Most Jews who are not Orthodox, who are under the age of 30, have a non-Jewish parent, and which which has a significant effect on the relationship to being Jewish and to um, and to and to Israel. Two, um, uh, American Judaism, American Jews have changed. And uh, Arnie Eisen and I wrote a book called uh, The Jew Within back in the year 2000. And there we, we, we coined the term the sovereign Jew or self. That is, that Jews are becoming much more individualist and much less collectivist. Um, a lot to say about that. In part, it's historical events, 63, 70, 67, 73, and, and so forth. Soviet Jewry, you know, things that made Jews collective and mobilized then are not around now. In part, it's America. Part of, as Stephen well pointed out, is assimilation. So now you have uh, fewer engaged Jews who have Jewish family um, who, and who think about being Jewish as a collective thing, as a, as a political or a group thing. And that's on the, that's on the American side. And when, I, when, I, when Ari Kalman and I wrote the, 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 the this thing hypothesis back in 2007, when we were talking about non-Orthodox Jews, um, when we, we, we attributed most of the decline, frankly, numerically, to intermarriage. If you just look at the marriage, are your parents intermarried? Are you intermarried? So and so on. There, you can almost explain the generational difference. Since 2007, starting around 2011, 2012, um, uh, the politics has, has come to play to start alienating uh, liberal American Jews. Uh, I, uh, when Peter Barnard wrote his first article in the New York Books, you know how to find it. Not, uh, um, I, I, I wrote Peter. I pulled Peter up. I said, Peter, this is you're wrong. There's no evidence to support your hypothesis. That liberal American Jews are fleeing Israel. I don't say that. And in the book that he wrote, as opposed to the article, he draws back. Recently, I was a, I was a scholar resident at his, at his shul, and I was sitting next to him. So I said, Peter, I have to apologize. You were pressing. I was wrong. Um, you, you know about Trotsky and Stalin. I was wrong. You were right. I should apologize. I was wrong. He was right. I should apologize. And I did. Um, uh, American liberal Jews are much more distant from Israel than conservative Jews. But there's a problem. Liberal, liberal Jews are less, quote unquote, Jewish than conservative Jews. Now, if you're looking at me and saying, who's this guy? What's he from? I am a flaming liberal. All right? Just be, I have great credentials to make this to make this, uh, to make this thing. I don't want to tell you how liberal I am, because half of you will ask me to leave. But I am so liberal. How liberal are you, Rocky? No, I'm so <laughs> I, am, I am so liberal that I, I really have the credentials to, to say this, and I, I get, I've given this talk. So it's not only that liberals are less Israel oriented; they're less Jewishly engaged, less less compromising. Is that understandable? We conflate pro-Israel, anti-Israel, no middle. Um, love Israel, love its policies. And what we see is, frankly, there's a correlation. People who, who, are, who love Israel tend to support its policies. People who are disengaged with Israel tend not to like its policies. However, there really, there really is a difference between policy liking and Israel loving. So you have people who love Israel and despise its policies. They think it is a, the policies are immoral, destructive, anti-Jewish, um, disgusting in, in every way, shape, or form, and they love Israel deeply. How do I know? I'm Israeli. I live in Tel Aviv. I made Aliyah. I made Aliyah in 1992. I'm a Zionist. My daughter is, can't tell you, she, she works for the, for, this, for the State of Israel. My son-in-law volunteered to fight in Gaza. This will let, let you know where we are. Um, but if you live in North Tel Aviv, that combination of I love Israel and I hate its policies deeply, not just like, oh, I hate Israel, really, really, really deeply, is, 
is, is normal. It's like it's what you see on sharpest morning when you go out and you go to the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what's, that, that's what's out there. You, you, you pick up and, and so, so now what about the American Jewish counterparts? But people who ally with that, who also feel like So there's, there's a lot of that less there. Not only is the complexity about loving Israel, hating his policy, whatever, but people who are dropping out of the Israel game, as my colleague, friend, co-author, um, uh, uh, Professor Ari Kelman of Stanford recently, recently detailed, supporting evidence from Len Sachs and, and, and Barry Cosman and other scholars and Ari Kelman Tessar, when, when young Jews on the campus say, I'm not Israel engaged, where are they going? Are they going to the, the other side, to the anti-side? No. They're going, they're, they're dropping out of the game. They're let it come. If you were the dealer, I'm out of the game. And that's, and that's what they're saying because the conflict alienates them. And they don't want to be involved in a conflictual situation. And like normal people, they avoid conflict, as do our federation directors, as our rabbis, as our leaders. They're all worried about what will the donors say from the right and the left, so better not to talk about Israel. And so thank God, and I give a lot of credit for organizing the session. So we got to talk about Israel. Thank you very much. We're going to have a second round and allow the speakers to respond to the brethren on uh, these issues. If you want to respond to anything that Steve, the two Steve said, uh, Rachel, will give you a first dip, um, and we'll go down, and then we'll open it up for questions. Population, 
um, is looking to find a way to engage with the American Jewish community, the younger generation, in serious mifkashim, and it's more than just about understanding religious pluralism, because many of them think that's interesting, but it's not necessarily there where they want to be. Um, but it is about how do we have this conversation to understand why certain issues are important in the North American community. So for example, Rayut Institute, this past summer in Israel, <coughs> was doing research on how did the Israeli, Israeli Jewish community respond to the conflict around women of the wall, right? And what they found was that the larger Israeli Jewish community from the younger generation up older couldn't care less, right? Whereas the American Jewish community is up in arms. And so they said, why is this on the front page of the Jerusalem Post, for example, and we don't even have a response as Israeli Jews to this, and didn't even see it coming and don't even understand why this matters. So that gap, right, which I do think is widening, and I would also say it's widening both in terms of the politics that you mentioned, when you have the uh, North American Jewish community who heavily democratic, the Israeli voting right of center, even if they don't love Bibi, they're still voting right of center. You have this gap in terms of being able to speak about religion and pluralism and secularism. And there isn't a dominant liberal Zionist position that the Israelis are putting forth that feels credible or authentic. And for sure, the American Jews and my generation and younger do not see a liberal Zionism that they can feel connected. So I think these are all real issues. Good point. Steve? Uh, three quick uh, observations about the discussion. Um, first, uh, you know, Rachel mentioned the uh, Irish Vid book. Um, there's no question this book was a phenomenon. Uh, putting aside uh, later revelations about his personal life, uh, when the book appeared, uh, it made an enormous hit on campus. Uh, I think Rachel is absolutely correct in saying it was an attempt at giving voice the liberal Zionism that we rarely hear. That said, anyone looking at the book should realize that the chapters on Lud and Ramla about expulsions in 1948, bear in mind those, those chapters are based entirely on interviews with 90-year-old people. Yep. There's no archival research in there whatsoever. Um, so in that respect, I'm not saying it's completely wrong, but before the book gets canonized, realize that these limitations are such that a, a good historian would not be using that as a Bible. Two other observations. Um, the, uh, the issue that Stephen raises, that uh, uh, some of the people who are most outspoken and critical of Israel are the ones who are most deeply attached. I think that's fair if you accept my pyramidal model. In other words, young people who stand as actively involved in Jewish life in leadership positions, if you will, keep people on, on campus. Uh, for years, I was on the faculty of the Wexner Foundation. Without question, the move, the move was one of uh, critical analysis of Israel, sometimes very hostile critical analysis, but born out of very deep-seated love. Oftentimes, the Jewish community has trouble handling that. Mm -hmm. My argument is always far more dangerous than hostility is indifferent. And I think what we are confronting among Jewish students today, see a bit upon this, is that once they realize the campus is not that receptive to support for Israel, they say, what do I need this for? Uh, I'd rather pursue my pre med studies. Um, so in that respect, again, the Jewish community hits upon those campuses where we say, well, the Jewish kids have become so, uh, so anti-Israel. I think we need to focus not so much on the anti and realize that some of it is immaturity, some of it is an overreaction. Some of it is actually born in love. But realize our long-term danger is much more that of indifference. Last comment, and this goes to say where I started out from. The beginnings of the problem lie within us, you know, inside the American Jewish community, and not necessarily with Israel. What do I mean by that? A former deputy foreign minister, minister of justice, who actually was perceived very negatively by the Jewish world, Yossi Bela, had one very important point that uh, often got lost in the shuffle. Phelan argued that since World War II, the unity of the Jewish people has been built around crisis. Crisis meaning existential dangers, threats to Jewish survival. Phelan argued, don't we have more 
that unites us in terms of heritage, aspirations, common values. Why don't we hear more about that? Now, no one listens because he made some political mistakes like trying to tell the women of Wieso, stop giving money to Israel, go home and support Jewish education. He chose the wrong to do for such a thing, and it was throwing out the baby with the bathwater. He was regarded as federation world's fundamental threat. Why should I continue giving to federation if it doesn't be able to tell us we don't need your money to begin with? What he was really saying was something else, is that what you're doing is sustaining the Jewish enterprise based upon threats to Jewish existence. Ask yourself, can you sustain the Jewish enterprise with as much passion and dedication on the basis of shared values, shared heritage, and shared aspirations? Very last comment. I do think, as I said earlier, there's one major exception to this overall rule, and that's the American Orthodox. Their attachment to Israel, obviously they will oftentimes speak a language of fear, threats, existential dangers. Their attachment to Israel is based upon realization of age-old Jewish dreams. I think the liberal Jewish world needs to have the same passion, commitment, and dedication as is found in the Orthodox today. This is great. We, we're, we're about to have this early conversation. Because in this early conversation, everybody talks to set the same point, the same time, and disagree. Except Jesse Bailey who sits there very quietly and, and, you know, and, and then waits for his turn. But, so we're not going to have that kind of conversation. Um, and I, so I want to have a conversation. And if, you know, if there was one little slice that we can go that you had, I want to add to that, uh, that I want to build, build upon. And I want to build upon this insight that uh, uh, I don't know, I, the, the insight that we need to project anti-government Zionists. We need them in the conversation, mm -hmm. both from Israel and, uh, and here. And that would help connect American Jews to Israel and avoid either retreat or, and, and provide people with actually a, a weapon, like you're one to fight, a weapon to fight the excesses of BDS and so forth. So we need people who say, I really dislike and detest and disagree with the policy of the government of Israel, and I'm a Zionist, and I love, I, I love Israel. <coughs> now I'll tell you a story which illustrates that. In the 1960s, whether I dated whoever it is we dated at Columbia University, um, I, I, was the, I was the Zionist leader at the university, and I was the student of Arthur Hertzberg, blessed memory. And this was 1969, 69, and I was working, I was a paid agent of the Jewish, uh, for the state of Israel, uh, paid for by the Jewish agency. I got $100 a month, it's a lot of money, right? and an expense account. Um, I was brought to Israel. And uh, Marla Baron, it's his name, he's something fine, who was the head of the Jewish agency, sent on a lecture tour a man by the name of Lova Eliyaf, who uh, in Israel was Secretary General of the Labor Party, who called on the air, kicked out of the Labor Party because he wrote a book called Eretz Hatsi, Land of the Heart, which talked about Palestinian nationals. Lova, uh, so the Jewish agency sent Lova Eliyaf, <coughs> this is including my camps. I remember Lova Eliyaf got up there and he told a story about, about the two men who were contesting who owns the Talit, and the rabbis say, it's not a child, it's Talit. This, this half belongs to you, that half belongs to, belongs to you. And he used that as a metaphor to talk about what has to happen to the land of Israel. We're, we're, we have two nations, both holding on, and they say, this talit is only mine. This talit is only mine. The only thing you can do is cut the talit in 1969. So in 1970, as the leading Zionist at Clinton University, I gave a, we had a debate with SDS on my, on my left, and they wanted a democratic, they didn't speak Arabic, a democratic, secular state of Palestine with Jews and Arabs voting equally. And I said, no, I want two states. I want a Jewish state and I want a Palestinian state. So from then on, I was a pro-Palestinian Zionist. And I met Aliyah. And my parents are buried in Shalai. And my daughter works for the, for the, for the state of Israel. And my son-in-law fought, volunteered to fight Aza, all, all, the, all the objections of my daughter. Um, but, and, and I have grandchildren in Tel Aviv, and I, I live in Tel Aviv, I've lived in Yushalayim for, for uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, what happened to me with all the Aliyah on the campus, I believe can happen again and again with Achino Amini, 
and David Grossman, and Amos Oz, and Tamar Zandberg, and Stav mm -hmm. Shafir, and Merav Michaeli. If these names, which are very, by the way, common in North Tel Aviv, my daughter and I were on the corner, she said, oh, that's Stav, Stav, that, 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 that Stav Shafir. She was riding in her bicycle with a little, a little helmet, a 32-year-old, who's like a major figure in the politics. If, if those people became household words here, and we contested with them, and we yelled at them, and they yelled at us, whatever, that would create a new space for American Jewry, for younger Americans to say, oh, I could love Israel and really work hard against the policies which I really detest. And that would also help us in the fight against BDS. You can say, you don't need to cut off relationships with the very people who want to do exactly what you do. So why don't we, why don't we join forces? Those people are too, are, those people, our people, are too much closed off American Jews. What we need to do is put them in front of American Jewish audiences, and we need to make, make it possible to be, and I'll say it last time, pro-Israel, but anti-Israeli policies. We're going to open it up for questions now. Uh, please direct your questions to the person you'd like to answer it, or direct it to me, and I'll hand it out to the people who are next to me. Please. Let's see. This works? Okay. So um, I am 52 years old. I wasn't born uh, at the time of Brown versus the Board of Education. And I was a toddler when Martin Luther King got shot. But I know a little something about the civil rights movement. So I think to say that they're young, so excuse them, is a ridiculous excuse. Mm -hmm. And that it's also a little bit insulting, I think, to young people's uh, intelligence that they shouldn't know something you know, about Israel. But what I think could be the issue is, um, like Dennis Prager said, it's really difficult to show pictures of freedom and democracy. It's really easy to show pictures of a burning tire. So I think like um, a lot of products and services and companies these days uh, that were household names of a generation ago need to reinvent themselves, maybe um, uh, why Israel is important to us just needs to be um, reinvented to this younger generation. Um, so for instance, if this younger generation, and I, I hate generalizations about the but if they are uh, more into, yeah, if they're more into water and resources, maybe you should you know, show them why, you know, what Israel's doing around water and resources. So is there a way to reinvent Israel and not just make excuses about, you know, they're, they're young and that's that. Yeah, so if you thought that I was making excuses, I, I want to be clear, I'm not making excuses, right? There are some studies who have shown and say, well, don't worry about what they're saying right now. As they get older, they're going to change their opinion. That's all I was saying. I'm not holding that position. What I want to say very clearly to you is a lot of work is being done precisely in that manner in a lot of ways. So one is, for example, there are um, business school treks, engineering treks that take MBAs and Masters of Engineering students and take them to Israel and say, look at Startup Nation, look at this exciting laboratory that the Jewish people have created, look at what they are doing in terms of technology, drip irrigation that's being exported around the world and show them all of that excitement and say, you can A, be part of this, whether you're Jewish or not. B, this is happening in a place where no one would have imagined in 1897 could possibly happen, but it is. And let's see where this can go. So that's part of like reclaiming Zionism or making Zionism relevant for the 21st century to some students. The other piece I want to say is, as someone who's deeply invested in education, 100% there's no excuse for not educating. But I want to say that our Jewish institutions, and I will say this very clearly, I think have failed many of our students, many of our young people, because they think that they only talk about falafel and camels on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, or that if they just talk about Israel as a technology amazing place, technological place, then they've done their job. And I just want to tell you from my experiences working on many college campuses, being a student and really taking a fight to some of the issues around BDS, when a student is confronted with serious threats of delegitimization of the state of Israel, just because Israel invented AOL Instant Messenger, no one cares. I want to be very clear. 
right? And so that's not going to help the student engage. They actually need real information. So for example, one of the things we did at Brandeis is we said, and we worked with the Cohen Center on this, we said, what do students, what do people need to know about Israel in the 21st century? And we actually created a literacy evaluative tool. And it's not just about the information you can find on Google, like how many seats are in the Knesset, but what does it mean when you read this excerpt from the newspaper? How do you understand it? And what's happening in Gaza today, if you don't understand Land Day from 1976 or Al Nakba Day, then you're not going to understand what's happening in Gaza. And you can't just pretend as if it doesn't have a historical framing. So we want to try to do that. We want to give students real education that's meaningful, that's not just advocacy, that doesn't just make them feel good, because as we know, education isn't about making you feel good. It's about teaching you real knowledge, helping you learn how to think, become a critical reader, and then engage in a meaningful way. So that's what we want to do. That's what I want to do. And the technology and the um, exciting pieces around entrepreneurship are an entryway into that, but they, again, are necessary, but by no means sufficient. Other questions, please, back. Uh, all, all of you have addressed the American Jewry. <coughs> to what degree does the current political leadership in Israel care about the American Jewry and how we feel and how we think? Good question. Steve, maybe too. Um, before I you know, get pretentious and try to speak on behalf of uh, the Israeli government, let me uh, say a word about American Jewish leadership. Uh, I suggest there are four major pillars behind the U.S.-Israel special relationship, which is different than any of America's other foreign relations, the possible exception of Great Britain. And that special relationship has been there with many ups and downs along the way, but it's been there really since 1967 with Lyndon Johnson. Now, what's behind it? What, is, what, is, what has sustained it over 50 years? Number one, a sense that Israel is a fellow democracy. Number two, Israel and, Soviet, Israel and the United States have faced common foes throughout its history. Soviet Union until 1991, threat of Islamic extremists <laughs> since 1991. Number three, something we oftentimes gloss over, that America is a deeply religious society. In that religious society, Christian society, Israel occupies a very favorable place. But number four, and this should never be shortchanged, is the passionate, sustained advocacy of what I call the top of the pyramid, Jewish, Jewish leadership here in the States, that wants to see the United States and Israel as closely aligned as possible, that's been there for 50 years. If that should fall, and I would suggest it's in danger primarily because of the issues of assimilation here in the United States, obviously facilitated by some of the other factors that I've mentioned. But if that sustained advocacy should fall, then there's no reason whatsoever why US foreign policy towards Israel should be all that much different, say, from the European democracies, Britain, France, Germany, all wonderful countries, but all of them, all of them have taken much more even-handed approaches to their relationship to Israel. That's the reason Israeli leadership should be concerned with American Jewish life. It, namely, the issue of Israeli national security depends upon sustained American Jewish advocacy. Is it concerned? I think you find a variety of different views. Um, much to my uh, dismay, if you will, uh, uh, Israeli leadership often dismisses the conservative reform movements here in the States. They say, why should you listen to them? when they're a declining commodity period. They listen to my speech on assimilation and say, you just proved your case. If they're about to disappear, why should you listen to them? The answer very bluntly and frankly, though, is that, number one, they're not disappearing tomorrow. Number two, so much of our efforts to sustain Jewish life here in the United States is based upon encouraging greater engagement with Israel. Don't make that difficult if not impossible for us. If in the future they disappear, that's a tragedy for Jews the world over. That's a tragedy for Jewish people. Don't make that a significant task, a significant hurdle for us to overcome. Now this relates to the third issue, and that is the, uh, some of the comments made by, by, Steve, by Stephen here, that um, uh, Israel is a very contentious society in which you have a cacophony of voices on the left and on the right and in the center. 
And those voices, some of the names that he's mentioned, I agree with some of them, I disagree with others, but you have that cacophony of voices. Why don't you see it here in the States? We have a historical memory, and I don't think we can get away from that memory. And that is that our advocacy efforts in the 1930s were hampered by the fact that you had a cacophony of voices. Uh, the late, record, late unlamented Breckenridge Long, who was Roosevelt's refugee officer, he wrote directly in his diary, there's no point in listening to the Jews, because you've got 50 Jewish organizations all coming down to Washington, each time telling us what to do. If you're trying to satisfy one of them, you're going to alienate 49 others. Now, in that respect, you tend to speak in a voice that is supportive of the government of Israel, being two steps behind the government of Israel rather than two steps in front of it, which is what others would, do, would suggest. It's a fair criticism to say we do not handle dissent well. We're not comfortable with it. But if you're asking, does this rate new leadership listen, one of the reasons that they do take it seriously is they know the American Jewish community is Israel's primary threat. And that goes far beyond what I call the network of Zionist organizations like Hadassah, includes those, those organizations that are well outside the so-called pro-Zionist consensus. That is a difficult thing to articulate on campus. Young people don't like hearing it. They prefer hearing the company of voices. But don't ignore the historical memory that once we were in a much more weakened position, precisely because of Jewish disunity, are the future of Jewish people. What I learned from those surveys, and I've lived in Israel, even, so you know, even I learned from these surveys. What the surveys taught me was that the Israeli public um, actually is rejectionist. It, it actually it takes it takes positions that are contrary to the aspirations of non-Orthodox American Jews on the issues that we, that often uh, divide us on, on conversion, on reformers, reformers, certain rabbis, on Palestinians, on all the issues. Small majorities to large majorities uh, take the other side. And those majorities grow even larger when you look, look at those Israelis who vote for the coalition parties. I, what, I, what I learned was that of the voters for this, the, the, the parties that said 65 Knesset members, that, uh, that have 65 Knesset members, 32% come from Haredi and Dati background. And the others are one third of the voters for the government parties are Haredi and Dati. They really have very little sympathy for the issues that divide American Jews in Israel. And then I asked a series of questions. Do you think the government should take into account American Jews on these issues? And, and the next survey, those American Jews. I don't know the details. But basically, they, they said no. They basically, they said, don't take, don't take their issues into account. As a result of these studies, I said, you know, I just realized Benjamin Netanyahu, who a lot of American Jews don't like, he really doesn't like, is uh, because he's taking positions to the conservative, actually is somewhat to the left of his voters. He's more moderate than his voters. I don't know why I say that. He made a deal on the Kotel and then reneged. He made a deal with the UN on the asylum seekers and then he reneged. His voters would never have made the deal in the first place. But, you know, he reneged because he got pushback from his own from his own voters. So I am I am not at all I, less I, I have you I've had conversations with mutual friends, not that we dated together, um, who, who, are, who are in the government, who have been had major positions in the government. And they said, you know, we can get through this. We don't need Europe, I mean, we'll, we'll do our best with Europe. We've got China, we've got Russia, and in America, we've got the Christians, we've got the Republicans, we've got the Orthodox. We could forge a new set of relationships of, of, of which Israel is, will have a bunch of, base, uh, I'll call them, right of center allies around the world, and we can get through this. Oh, and the, uh, and the local uh, Arab countries. Well, you know, and that, by the way, and you know what? I have to say, and I, I, I don't like these policies, I have to say, there's, there's something to it. Like, it's actually, it's, it, uh, at least until yesterday, tomorrow, the next day, it, it's working. Last comment, the, in the back. How can you say, well, what you were saying, I'm not sure if you were, how can you say, how can you appear to say, at least to me, that, uh, that here we all the wonderful stories about Israel, which I, by the way, I agree with you, can have any effect on, on American Jews or, you know, Elliot or whatever. When you look at today's New York Times, look at the front page, 
and the 60 Palestinians killed, killed by, by Israel, you can talk about whether you know, right or wrong, you turn to the editorial page, and the leader to the New York Times is highly critical of Israel, and then you got Michelle Goldberg giving us the Leonard Cohen story. If, this, if you're the dealer, I'm out of the game. And, uh, and she's not the first one. Tom Friedman's been there too. So, so it, we, cannot, we cannot avoid the Palestinian issue. We cannot say we give them high tech, we give them pink washing, we give them, we give them cuisine, we give them all the, all the wonderful things that we do to, 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 to care for people. We give them medical care, right? We'll tell them all these stories, and they'll love Israel. Yeah, but the front page of the Times is still going to be there week after week, day after day. And that's the issue that is, and has now, in the last 10 years, caused a split between liberal American Jews, which is the majority outside of orthodoxy, and conservative American Jews. And, and we cannot avoid the Israel-Palestinian conflict and, and talking about it in a, ser in a serious way.